Well, I saw this article today in the Washington Examiner. It was written by my next guest, Christopher Bates. He's a legal fellow at the uh, Orangey Hatch Foundation. He talked about a family-centered approach to criminal justice reform, and Christopher is joining us on our Newsmaker Line right now. Christopher, how are you, and welcome to the show. I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting me to uh, chat today. Well, let's talk about this, Christopher. Thank you for coming on. What do you mean by a family-centered approach to criminal justice reform? So, I mean, taking a look at these issues through the lens of how they, both how they impact uh, families, but also uh, how family uh, relationships uh, impact these issues as well, in particular, how family relationships relate to recidivism and the ability that folks have once they leave prison to get a job, find secure housing, and successfully uh, re-enter society. And um, part of the thinking here was spurred by a, a webinar that we had uh, earlier this year that a woman named Alice uh, Marie Johnson spoke at. Um, so Alice Marie Johnson, she served about 20 years uh, in prison for a drug trafficking offense before she, um, she was pardoned by President Trump. Uh, she spoke at the uh, Republican National Convention about her mm-hmm, experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when she came and spoke with us, she talked about, you know, so she was in prison for 20 years, how difficult it was for her being separated from uh, her children, uh, what a challenge that was, and other folks in prison that she knew as well. And how important from her perspective it was for folks to be able to maintain those relationships so that it, when they leave prison, you know, it's not such a challenge to reconnect and uh, that they can, you know, uh, be able to, you know, turn to their families for support, but also that they are so important for finding employment and secure housing after they get out as well. Why do we keep, fam- you know, uh, those who've been convicted of a crime and family far apart at times? I mean, I, I think I, I saw your story and she mentioned it was she was hours and hours away from her family. It was very difficult for yes. her family to see her. I mean, why do we get into that position to begin with, Christopher? So I think part of it, at least at the federal level, has to do with the fact that there are fewer uh, federal prisons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sometimes Mm -hmm. it's difficult to put folks close to where their families are just because the prison may be far away. But that's that's not always the case and certainly is not uh, the case as much at the state level. And in fact, uh, federal law uh, allows flexibility to the Bureau of Prisons in where they house prisoners. And so, you know, sometimes it's just a fact that it's not always a priority for decision makers. But one interesting thing that, um, that the research shows is that there is a relationship between recidivism, so how likely somebody is to commit another crime once they get out, mm-hmm. and how much contact they have with their family, both in-person contact and how much contact they're able to have over phone and over video. So it's not just that you know, keeping folks connected with their families is good because it's, you know, it's nice for the person in prison and it's nice for their family, but it actually can have a strong impact on helping people get on their feet once they get out of prison. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this all should be about ensuring that once people get out, they return to the communities, they're, you know, able to become productive, productive members of society. And so that's an important part of when we talk about this family-centered approach is really recognizing how family relationships can help people return to society. And that means ensuring that they're able to stay strong while they're in prison as well. Christopher, in writing this uh, column that you had in the Washington Examiner today, um, are people talking about this? People who are looking at, at criminal justice reform and talking about a maybe more family-oriented or family-centered approach? Is it is it coming up for discussion now? Well, so we're trying to, you know, that's that's one thing we're trying to do at the Hatch Foundation is bring bring some attention to this issue, and we, and we think it's a way to, to look at the issue that can have uh, particular appeal or interest uh, to conservatives, mm-hmm, right? You know, mm-hmm. folks that believe in strong families, you know, we know the family is so important. We fought for so many years to help to, you know, strengthen the family and society. And the research shows that that's a critical aspect of successful criminal justice policy as well. You know, so there's been research, you know, for many years about what the impacts of incarceration are on a families and children and how, you know, having a parent in prison can lead to, uh, you know, poor performance in school, worse uh, physical and mental health. And I've talked about the research that shows how strong family relationships help folks do better once they get out in prison. But we think that sort of, you know, applying this lens of family impact sort of to the broad scope of criminal justice reform is really a way that can, you know, inform these discussions, but also have interest and appeal to folks who are, you know, right of center. And, you know, we sort of have this 
you know, sense, this knowledge that families are so important, and that's you know, how we should be looking at this issue as well. How does police reform get uh, uh, How is police reform involved in this, Christopher? Is there an angle that we should be taking a look at as well on a family-centered criminal justice reform, but also police reform and how they work together? So I, I talked about this just very briefly at the end of the op-ed. It's not as perhaps direct of an impact as when we talk about, you know, how close folks should be housed to their families in prison or, you know, folks finding jobs or housing when they get out. But I think that, you know, if we think about uh, how family relationships are important for, you know, people when they get out, that, that highlights the importance of interpersonal relationships, have, you know, trust, people trusting each other, uh, you know, having strong communities as well. And I think that that can, to some extent at least, inform police reform discussions because it's important for there to be good relations between police, law enforcement, and the communities that they serve. You know, we don't want law enforcement police to be strangers to their communities. It's important for there to be, uh, for, for there to be trust. It's good for folks to know uh, who their local officers are. There's been research done about how it can be beneficial for officers to even live in the communities that they serve or live near to them. So it's not necessarily as direct, but uh, the idea that relationships between people are really important to building trust and helping just, you know, better outcomes generally, I, I think, can can help to inform those discussions. Do you know, Christopher, on an average, how often an inmate gets to interact with their family? Is it once a week, once a month? Does it depend on the rules? Does it depend on the sentence? Do you know what the average is? Uh, so it can vary. Uh, it can vary quite a bit. I don't have the statistics in front of me. One thing that really stood out to me um, that I mentioned in the op-ed is that something like, you know, uh, a little bit less than half of inmates in federal prison and uh, a little more than half of inmates in state prison never have personal contact. So they're relying on mail and uh, phone contact, which obviously is, is easier in most cases. Um, and I, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I believe that it's something like 20 to 30 percent don't have any contact at all. Um, and then uh, another 30 or 40 percent will have uh, monthly contact, usually by phone or email, and then, you know, the remainder may have more common contact than that. Mm -hmm. Christopher, great conversation. Thanks for a few minutes of your time this afternoon, and enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much. You as well. All right. On our Newsmaker line, Christopher Bates is a legal fellow at the Orange Hatch Foundation talking about a family-centered approach when we're talking about criminal justice reform. I think some very good ideas.